This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 550. This is your spoiler-free place for Star Wars community and conversation. I'm your host, Dan Zaire, thrilled to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you. You can support Coffee with Kenobi by following the show on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and TikTok, and by subscribing to the YouTube channel. Help to spread the word by tweeting that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your family and friends to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. CWK is a proud member of the Spreaker Prime program. Thank you to the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. If you are interested in a no-cost, no-obligation quote for your next vacation, check out coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and let them know Coffee with Kenobi and Dan's there sent you. Thank you also to members of the CWK Alliance. Find out how you can join the Alliance for as little as $1 a month and get access to exclusive podcasts, videos, and much more at coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance. On today's blockbuster show for the 550th episode of Coffee with Kenobi, I am joined by Phil Tippett, Dennis Murin, Janet Lewin, and Lawrence Kasten, the director of Light and Magic. In fact, all these amazing creatives, of course, Phil Tippett and Dennis Murin are ILM legends, and Janet Lewin is the senior vice president and general manager of Industrial Light and Magic. I was part of an exclusive roundtable and got to ask them a couple of questions about the amazing Light and Magic series available now exclusively on Disney+. Plus. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. First in this amazing roundtable conversation that I got to have with these incredible peers of mine and these legends for Industrial Light and Magic and Lucasfilm in general, first we're going to talk with Phil Tippett and Dennis Murin Two absolute legends of ILM and Lucasfilm that I can't believe I got a chance to talk to. Phil Tippett is an Oscar and Emmy winner and did the visual effects for many of the films that you know and love. Naturally, of course, Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back and so many other things, even Jurassic Park. Then, of course, we have Dennis Murin, who has won, count this, nine Oscars in total, eight for Best Visual Effects and a Technical Achievement Academy Award both of these guys are legend. It was a complete honor to chat with them. So let's go ahead and listen to this roundtable with these two. Just like other roundtables I've been a part of, several of the members of the media are able to get a chance to ask a question. And I'm going to share the questions from my peers. And then I will play the responses from the talent. First up is the site Frog, who wants to know what does it feel like with all the technological advances being able to do special effects and visual effects from home? Uh, well, I, I like it. It's empowering. <clears throat> it's liberating. You know, you can, the fact that you can actually work at home and, and learn stuff and how to do it, you know, I think it's, it's great. It was such a struggle when Phil and I and my generation were growing up, you know, to do it. Uh, but something that has been lost is it's been so easy to do it that I think everybody is kind of copying maybe everybody else. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it sort of seems like it. And we needed, we would, uh, I think we were trying more for original stuff when we were starting out doing it because it was so hard to put things together perfect. So your tools may not quite fit what you had in your mind, but that would be a different direction. But now with CG, you can pretty much just do anything. And uh, that's one of the dangers of it. You know, there's a, maybe a needs to be some more inspiration sticking in there. You know, once you learn the tools, then you can get some more inspiration for it. And one of the things that that was very uh, helpful or essential in our education was the movies that inspired us. Uh, in particular, um, you know, Ken Ralston, Tom Sandman, and Dennis and I were inspired by <clears throat> Ray Harryhausen's and Seven Voyages of Sinbad. And you, you would see that once, and then you wouldn't see it again for another 10 years ago on a small black and white television. And so you made stuff up, you know? Um, and you did your own original creations, and you slowly figured out what the process was. 
and learning stop motion for me was very it was a vertical climb and unlike uh you know the younger people today who have such access to media and all kinds of technology yeah you know, everything's at their fingertips and dennis and i have, have talked about this that that was really a huge value for us was having to reconstruct things in our mind and use our imaginations rather than having uh yeah you know, a plethora of things to you know copy or you know make things easier i mean it, it was really a vertical climb Next up, GQ Insider wanted to talk about the special effects and visual effects from the 90s and how they hold up so well. Well, just having people that, you know, particularly, you know, for with Dennis and I, you know, um, uh, you know, we were, you know, very well educated with the, uh, you know, pretty much the same techniques as, you know, Ray Harryhausen used, except the technology had significantly changed. And, um you know, so that that was, uh, you know, but we always had to adapt to technology, you know, no, no matter what, you know, so we went from stop motion to go motion to computer graphics. And um, that was pretty much the, the trajectory. And each time you had to, you know, relearn what, um, you know, I, I would give like anything like go motion or uh computer graphics was like your hand is stradivarius and um now you have to learn how to play it and so that was always a vertical climb yeah i you know i started off i was sort of rooted in the stuff that had been going on in the 20s and 30s from uh you know king kong and those even the ray areas and stuff but Going on to Star Wars, I thought this is a way too complicated way to do this work. There's much simpler ways to do it. But after being on it for a little while, a few months, seeing what John was trying to do and what George wanted, I could start to see, you know, there's an advantage to this. I just had never had the money or the real interest in trying to go somewhere else because I thought what was working was working and it was really the tools for an expression of your art. But then I kind of saw that no, there's, you can actually change the tools and maybe the tools can, can benefit the art. And so since that time, I've always just been curious and always looking for new ways to do things, whether I use them or not is a whole different thing, but knowing what's out there as far as possibilities, to if I can get them to fit into what's in my head as an idea of how something should look and, and doesn't, maybe I can see a way to put the tool set together or make a new tool that will fix something that I think needs fixing in the, and nowadays on the CG, for example. Yeah, I came in late on, on Star Wars and would go in Venice, um, um, Ken and um, Dennis, uh, they were on the night crew, and was, you know, introduced to the, the uh, motion control technology, <clears throat> which led to go motion, you know, um, you know, within a, a couple of movies. And, um, you know, so I, when, once I saw that stuff, I realized, wow, you know what you could do with this? You could do what stop motion animators had wanted to do for years and successfully was to have blurs on, on your characters. And, um, yeah, so then we, you know, we had the, the resources to, um, do it. Next up, Pascal wanted to know about how Phil and Dennis feel about the resurgence of practical effects being used alongside CGI. Well, I think the quotient of practical stuff is <clears throat> really minimal compared to the computer graphics stuff. I mean, it isn't until you get, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, directors like Christopher Nolan who really insist on doing practical things. And if a director insists, then yeah. But um, in many ways, uh, you know, a project like Quran's, you know, gravity couldn't have been uh, executed in any other way. Yeah, and I, you know, I sort of think that, uh, you know, there's room for everything. And there's a reason why there's, that CG has kind of took off because it could do things that you just could not do at all with models and still can't do with models. And if they and now they can write those into the scripts, and the stories can tell 
stories that they weren't able to tell before. And you really see that, you know, especially with Phantom Menace, that, that was a breakthrough film for George to be able to make all those cities and landscapes and robotic creature crawl, robots walking around with that, actors. I mean, that had not been done before. And there's dozens of them. And that's all through that film. That film just illuminated, I think, for everybody what the possibilities were for storytelling, which is what he wanted, uh, George wanted, uh, how you can open up people's imaginations and entertain them now. And now with what's going on all over, there's got to be, I don't know what, 10,000, 15,000 effect shots being done every year now. I'm just guessing on that number, but I don't think I'm very far off. Next up, Caitlin from Sky Talkers want to know if there are any challenges with balancing their friendships alongside their professional duties working on films together. Too many. <laughs> no, I don't think so, because we, we we went in different paths. I stayed at ILM because I like working on big movies, and Phil had this dream, you know, to make his own sort of thing and wanted to be independent. So, and we kept touch through all those years, and, you know, when Phil could come back and we wanted to back at ILM, he'd get him back in, and he'd go out and make his film. So, I don't think it's you know, it's been great because it's, uh, you know, we're in a lot of ways, we're completely different people, but we have the same, you know, interest in our, in our background growing up. And now we have life experiences that we can share, you know, so we're, we're very uh, lucky to be able to have that history, you know, for like 45 years or 50 years, whatever it's been, maybe 55 years. I don't know. Could be. Charlotte from Sky Talkers wants to know if there's a film or project that helped them to develop their skills and challenge them the most. You know, all, I, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Could be all of them. That's good. For me, the most challenging one and maybe the improving was, you know, probably for actually for Empire, where we had to put all this stuff together to get that done. All the battles and the Walker sequence looking photo real and Everything was quite a real challenge. But that whole period for me with, you know, when we were doing The Abyss and Drastic and before that T2, being able to get the pieces together for that and seeing and having to learn things I didn't care about, like, you know, lookup tables for color, you know, size of film grain, you know, uh, just incredible stuff that I had not really ever thought of. That was quite a challenge during that whole period. And, yeah, uh, the, the stuff that Dennis did lighting the Tauntaun walkers was um, really old school, you know, with um, the, the sets were uh, model sets of the Hoth and, um, you know, the backgrounds were painted by Michael Pingrazio, which we were so lucky to run across. And none of the stuff looks realistic. But it's just beautiful, you know, and it just takes you away. It's, it has a very old school look with a, mo a modern coat of paint on it. And, you know, I think a lot of stuff that, that Dennis and I, you know, uh, agree on. I mean, you're always, for these movies, aspiring for something that's real realistic, but it's never going to be uh, real. And so you, uh, the, the best you could do is make something hyper real, which is what filmmakers do all the time um, to, um, you know, I mean, everything was really a prototype. Uh, everything we did, we tried something new. I don't think right, we're, uh, just real quick, I don't think we're seeing a lot of that in CG. I think that would really help CG work if you can take it to that next level of hyper real. You know, they're getting it to look real, but that's not really what you want it to be engaging. And that can mean you can cheat this, you can brighten that, you can, it's okay, this doesn't look right, but if this is, is bigger in the frame, are the teeth brighter than they really should be, but you're thinking about, am I gonna die? All that stuff is what, what we used to add to stuff. And I think that needs, that's what directors do when they direct the live actors, they try to, and the actors try to put it in, but it's hard for effects people to try to put that in the CG world, especially when someone's, you know, supervisors work on one or 2000 shots, you know, too many shots. Trisha from Fangirl Blog asks, why is there such a fascination with these behind the scenes looks into how movies are made? I, I had been working on this, you know, movie that's been recently released called Mad God. And a number of my, the guys in my studio 
uh, were inspired uh, by you know the documentaries on Star Wars and Robocop and whatnot. And that's what they had wanted to do, you know, uh, is work with practical things and lights and um, and models. And, you know, that that ship had sailed. So they were computer graphic artists. And this project that I wanted to do, Mad God, was, you know, pretty much a stop motion project. And so that that uh, gave them the, you know, opportunity to um you know, do what they'd always dreamed of doing, work with, you know, practical things. And it might be that in the CG world, I think there's a sameness that you can see. And it's hard to tell where that comes from. Some of it is technological, the texturing, the artificiality here. But shot after shot after shot goes by. And at some point you get dull, dull. Maybe there's too many shots, but maybe there the expression hasn't been put into each shot. And when you do it the old way, when Phil does it his way or Harry Osen does it or anybody, you're sitting on that shot, setting it up, you decide what's important. And everything is aimed for what is important. It's not a lot of neutral things assembled together and it just runs itself. You're just thinking all the time, I want to show this, I don't want to show that. I want to see too much here, that should move faster there, I'm ready to go, okay, and you start. But in your mind, you already are seeing it as an individual important thing, as opposed to one of many dozens and dozens of things that are being assembled by a lot of different people. Yeah, that that can't be put into CG, but it's hard to put it into CG, but it can be. Yeah, it's very much like doing a painting, you know, as you're setting up, you know, you may move things around, you know, quite a bit as you're, as you're kind of finding out what you want to do. I remember there was a, uh, you know, when we were setting up the walker shots, um, you know, Dennis had lit the shots and um, we were shutting down for lunch and the, the lights were being turned off one at a time. And I said, just stop, stop turning off the lights and called Dennis over and said, look, look at, look at what happened. It's like the foreground walker was in shadow and the background one was in sunlight. And it was like, oh, wow, that gave it a different form of like atmospheric, you know, perspective. And, you know, uh, so many things happen like accidents like that. Gentlemen, an honor to speak with you both. If you could, with all of your experiences and vast knowledge, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your younger selves? Keep working, keep doing it, follow your passion. It sounds trivial. It sounds like you've heard it before but there's something to be said for it, be different and uh, be curious and study what you wanna do and study things you don't think you wanna do. If you wanna make movies, study real movies and but and not just the effectsy films, but then you wanna see how they fit into it. But I, and it's never been a better time to be a filmmaker or a media maker now ever than there is right now. And everyone's, oh, the distribution, everyone's making them. Can't get my film out there. Well, you've at least made something, right? So people can see it. And in our day, you could hardly even make anything. So it's a great time to experiment and, you know, go for it. The, the term passion is interesting because it comes from the Latin patai, which means to suffer. Like, Jesus on the cross. And that, that's certainly been my experience. You know, uh, part of its result of me being bipolar is like once I get started on stuff, I'm uh, like ugly on an ape, you know, and it just like I just won't stop until I crash. But it's uh, it really is that that, you know, kind of hero's journey of going down paths that lead to paths that lead to doors that lead to paths. And um, you just don't know exactly where you're going, but, <clears throat> you know, that, that's the journey. And sometimes you can, you know, run into, like, <laughs> animals that want to eat you. And let me just add also that it's also possible that when what is in your head and what you want to do, most people don't care about that, you know. And, it, and so you're not necessarily going to become really successful at this or being on big films or something. And then you've got a decision to make. Am I going to be an artist working on my own for myself? Maybe find something that's fine to do. It, you know, you got to make a living somehow. 
And, uh, you know, so there's, it doesn't have to, if it's really hard for you doing something, then maybe really try something else, you know, because this work for all the this torment that Phil can talk about, and I went through some of it too, you still get enough back in return that you want to keep doing it or you can't help yourself from doing it. You know, if you're not enjoying it at some point, I think you should not be doing it because it's too hard on you. There should be some, at the end, you add up the balance sheet and you're better off and happier having done it. Lastly, Guillerme wants to know if there is a shot or a special effect that hasn't necessarily been as obsessed over as others throughout the history of motion pictures. No, I can't think of anything, you know. I mean, everybody seems to like everything, you know. Um, I recall that when um, Empire was released, uh, I guess the numbers that came back was the <laughs> the Tauntaun, you know, was uh, not as uh, popular as the the walking machines, but the walking machines were a, a set piece, and the um, Tauntaun was nothing more than a horse. You know, what was important about those shots was Luke. You know, so the Tauntaun was just a thing that took him from place to place, but uh, all the attention was really focused on his character that George had developed. So there you have it for Dennis Muren and Phil Tippett, two really fascinating guys. I could just sit there and listen to them talk all day, and you get to hear them throughout Light and Magic. Again, the six-episode series that is now out exclusively on Disney+. Plus. Next, I got to speak with Janet Lewin, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Industrial Light and Magic. First up is Noah again from Froggy, who wants to know, how does it feel to be in charge of the magic at ILM? It, it feels great. I mean, I it, it is not all on me. We have a amazing team um, of seasoned leaders in every aspect of the organization, creative leadership, production leadership, technology leadership. Um, but I'm so proud of the work that is being featured and celebrated in the documentary. And I feel just truly um, honored to be here with you guys and to be a part of the company that's inspiring so many other people to get into the industry. Um, so, yeah. Trisha Barr from Fangirls Going Rogue wanted to ask, between technology and art, which road did you take to get to the path where you are now? Well, I was on the third road, which is production. So I always talk about the intersection of production, creativity, and innovation. But yes, art is also a through line um, of all of that. But um, I, I actually started as a, as a temp in the purchasing department 28 years ago and kind of wove my way through the organization, but really found my passion in producing, visual effects producing. Um, and, you know, I, I think of myself as creative, but that's not my um, strong suit. I'm really more on the business side of the house, um, but I love that partnership with creative and really, you know, providing the structure and the support and the environment for people to do their best work. Hello, the evolution of ILM is mythology unto itself. What was important for you about telling this story? Well, I think it's really about celebrating the fact that that we're filmmakers through and through and that no challenge is too hard, uh, that that's part of our DNA, that we we love achieving the impossible and, you know, and being in the fabric of these amazing films that inspire so many people around the world um, and that that continues into the future. It's not as though it's, it was just, you know, back in the day that there was a certain methodology or a certain way of working. We've continued to evolve and adapt. And um, I think it's important for, for people to know that we have the same spirit and DNA um, of, of the, our legacy, but that we're, we're still inventing and innovating um, every single day of the year. Next, Sky Talkers wants to know if Janet working on the sequel trilogy influenced or impacted the development 
of the volume? Not those three films per se. However, I think every film, you know, we build our pipeline and we build our capabilities on uh, in every single film um, to get to where we are today. But it was really Rogue One of the Star Wars films that um, really moved the needle in virtual production. And part of that was uh, Greg Frazier, who was our DP on uh, Rogue One. And then he was also the DP on The Mandalorian, which is where you saw the volume really in all of all its glory. Um, but, you know, for Rogue One, we we didn't have the right pipeline and technology to do what we ultimately were able to achieve on The Mandalorian with real time in camera visual effects for the run of show, but we dabbled in it um, on Rogue One and we used a lot of our virtual camera tools as well to for Gareth to kind of find his shots in a more collaborative way. Um, so those things proved that it was possible to do what we ultimately did on, on The Mandalorian, of course, together with John Favreau and his pioneering experience in virtual production on uh, Jungle Book and Lion King. So next up is laughingplace.com who wanted to know about the working relationship and interactions with the legendary Lawrence Kasdan. Um, well, you know, Lawrence Kasdan has been a long time collaborator for both Lucasfilm and Industrial Light and Magic. And I think when he got involved with uh, Solo um, with Ron Howard, he, um, you know, sort of had this brainchild about wanting to honor the legacy of all these, you know, the visual effects uh, contributions to some of the most, um, you know, memorable films uh, of all time. Um, we gave him sort of unfettered access to anything he wanted to explore for his documentary. It was really his vision, though. It was, you know, he was coming at it from the vantage point of a seasoned filmmaker and writer and wanting to tell a story that, you know, you didn't have to be steeped in visual effects or even really in, in the film industry to enjoy it. Um, so, you know, he had, he interviewed lots of people who've been at the company for a long, long time and could tell interesting stories about, you know, how, how they achieved their work. Next is Ekron Fantastique. Wanted to know about the future of using actual miniatures and practical effects and real textures with computer imagery. Yeah, that's a great question. And we don't have a workshop per se, but we do still employ people who got their start as miniature modelers and even motion control operators and traditional map painters. We have a lot of people who, you know, learned their craft painting on, on shower glass doors and then had to learn a new way of working in computer graphics. Um, but I will say that, you know, one of the really fun things about being, you know, involved in the Star Wars films is that, and episodic shows, is that there's a desire to honor our legacy with those kinds of handcrafted visual effects. So we do actually build a lot of miniatures for The Mandalorian, as an example. Um, the Razor Crest we built as a miniature. Some of the environments that we then photograph and put into our volume um, loads, as we call them, the the real-time um, images up on the LED screens are from miniatures that we build. So we absolutely love to leverage all of these legacy tools, just like you say, to kind of have this layered approach that is um, that you can feel is more kind of handcrafted than you might get in just traditional computer graphics. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Now, Guillermo wants to know, what will you take from all this that will help impact and shape the future of Star Wars after reflecting on this series? Well, as you know, Light and Magic isn't just about Star Wars, right? It's about our, our you know, vast array of projects that ILM has contributed to over the last 47 years. And... 
I think, you know, we're, we continue to get involved in any project that is creatively um, inspiring to us. So we're working on 40 different shows at the moment, including feature animation projects, episodic, live action films, uh, immersive entertainment, and kind of everything in between. And I think that when we look to our past, we can see that we've got just these amazingly talented, creative individuals who um, love to solve problems and and take chances and leaps of faith to realize, you know, new um, visions for for whether it's Star Wars or any other project that is um, in house. The cool thing about ILM's relationship with Lucasfilm is that we have a transparency really with that studio. I mean, we're one company, um, but it's a symbiotic relationship. So ILM and our innovation roadmap and some of the, the breakthroughs that, that we're making can help influence Lucasfilm's storytelling. And likewise, where we can have a look at the, at the slate and know what is, is, uh, coming down the road and kind of get prepared for that in advance. So it it really um, is a is a wonderful way for us to partner with with Lucasfilm. Um, and creatively, we have, I think, you know, I would say visual effects is in the fabric of the Star Wars films and any kind of Star Wars um, product. And we have, you know, seasoned creatives who provide that bench of talent and are are sought after by all of the filmmakers to understand what is it that is Star Wars. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of the answer is it's visual effects. Next up is William with a great question who wants to know, how do you combine different generations of talents depending on, for example, someone growing up working during A New Hope versus someone who's grown up in the 90s and 2000s and has been a part of CGI from adolescence? And how do you kind of bridge the gap in the different generations and using their talents to create film? I, I, I would say maybe the younger filmmakers can, can be a little more ambitious in terms of, you know, their um, appetites for for visual effects on a, in a short schedule, um, you know, because computer graphics moves way faster than the techniques of uh of the older generation you know with miniatures motion control you know things of that nature but i think that all filmmakers are really savvy the filmmakers who we work with especially are very savvy about um you know what is at their disposal and oftentimes they really rely on a visual effects supervisor to guide them to to and that's something that ilm does all the time we we will um, assess methodologies and give, you know, give advice, but also, you know, sort of an analyze what the, what the cost schedule and creative implications are for approaching work in one, one way or another. Um, so I think that is something that filmmakers really come to ILM to help them, um, you know, sort of articulate their, their, methodology and their vision. Next, we have Bant Meg asking about how stagecraft has changed the dynamic of visual effects. Uh, well, stagecraft is, you know, as we were saying earlier, sort of the culmination of many, many years of ILM's experience in virtual production. The interesting thing is, you know, that while on The Mandalorian, it is actually really part of the, of of the filmmaking, you know, fabric. Um, and, but that isn't always the case. You can use the same methodology for a sequence or a set of shots or pickups or whatever. But for the Mandalorian, I think what, what we have kind of discovered is that the real benefit is that by being able to visualize your shots in real time on set with your filmmakers, with your production designer, your DP and visual effects supervisor, 
but you're making better choices, you know, and um, one of the anecdotes that uh, Rob Bredo, who's our chief creative officer, talks a lot about is um, on Solo, they used LEDs for uh, outside of the Millennium Falcon. And when Alden Ehrenreich, who was playing uh, Han Solo, first goes to hyperspace, you actually can see the reflection of the of hyperspace in his eyes. Um, and so the the DP suddenly reconceived of the shot to really, you know, zoom in on his eye and you get the sense of amazement, but also the reflection of, of hyperspace. And you probably would, would never have even thought of a shot like that without these kinds of tools. So, you know, those happen every single day on the Mandalorian. It's, um, and that's what keeps it really fresh and exciting and fun. And it's, you're, you're not handing off problems downstream that haven't been um, thought through. You know, the using stagecraft means you have to be a little more disciplined. You've got to plan and approve things earlier in the process than, than most films um, that don't have a, a virtual production aspect. Um, but the payoff is huge. So, and it can be financially um, attractive too. If you're able to get a whole bunch of visual effects shots in camera, um, that can save you a lot of time and money as well. So it can kind of be that trifecta of quality, time, and uh, and uh, e e economics. Finally, Sky Talkers wraps up this roundtable asking Janet, what does she hope that people will take away from ILM and its legacy after watching this series? Uh, I would say that we are filmmakers who are passionate about the craft of visual storytelling, um, that innovation is in our DNA, but it's a really fun place to work with very collaborative people who, you know, really elevate the craft and also elevate the, the experience for filmmakers and for all of us in, in the company. And now my conversation and my peers with the legendary Lawrence Kazan. Lawrence Kazan, of course, is the writer of The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, as well as a co-writer on The Force Awakens and Solo. Lawrence Kazan is a legend. This is one of the most incredible interviews I got to be a part of. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Lawrence Kasdan. First, Mike asks Lawrence, what is the difference between directing a narrative piece versus a documentary? It was my first long form. I had made a little documentary just before this with my wife about a diner that we used to eat at that was closing. And when we made that documentary, I loved it. I loved making it, shooting it, cutting it. I loved everything about it. And I started meeting documentary people. And I met the people at Imagine. And they said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, well, what about the history of uh, visual effects and they said well we have a, a relationship with Disney and Lucasfilm what about that and I said well that, that's where I grew up I've been around ILM for all these years that's perfect and I wanted it to be about the people not the technology and that's what I hope the show is about I was so amazed by this collection of geniuses and I wanted to make a show about that uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Kazan. As your as a director, what was the research and editing process like for this entire production? Well, it was fantastic because Lucasfilm is probably the best archive, best documented enterprise in movies. Because George, right from the beginning, wanted behind the scenes. He wanted, he kept all the paintings. He kept all the drawings. He kept all the set design. And so when we went in here, it was richer than any of us thought. And they gave us access to things that have never been seen in the world. And so what it gives you over the course of the six hours, I think there are several occasions where you hear them trying to figure out an effect. And we actually have them in the room trying to figure out the effect. Well, that's kind of astounding. And uh, that, that kind of thing happened a lot. And I, I find that very emotional and stirring. And uh, I like that part of it. Next up, Mario asked about the different commentaries throughout this series 
and the different leadership that evolved through everyone working together and collaborating. Mario, you're exactly right, because that was one of my things I wanted to focus on. You know, I have grandchildren now, and I want them to be look at these shows and say, oh, you know, if I want to create something, it's possible. And what are the elements? You have to have the will, and then you have to figure out what are the means. And these people started when they were 10 years old, 12 years old. The effects that you see at the beginning with these people are astounding. How did they do that, you know? And um, so I wanted it to be about what inspires that. And to some degree, it was George because he put together this group of eccentric geniuses and they came from all walks of life. They weren't movie people. And yet they all engaged in this enterprise that for 40 years they've been helping directors achieve what's in their head and sometimes it's not even in their head sometimes a director will say i want something like this what do you got and these people won't go into the closet and pull something out they will say we're going to create something just for this shot next up is gil hermay who asks, after watching this entire series, what is one main characteristic of violin that stands out to Lawrence? Yeah, you know, there was, when I went into it, I had a hope. And my hope was, I can, I suspected that the emotional atmosphere at ILM for 40 years was unique. That there was a kind of cooperation among these geniuses that was uh, astounding. And that, yes, they were competitive, and yes, they worked hard, and yes, they competed with their ideas. But they basically would turn to their friends, their compadres, their colleagues, and say, how are we going to do this? How we solve this problem? This is the problem of the day. And so coming up with that in a community in which people care about each other, I found that to be the most attractive part of the whole thing. Next up is Mirden, who wanted to know about the effects of Star Wars visual effects and how they impacted cinema in general. Well, I think everything changed when A New Hope came out. And you can see in the show that these people who have been working there for 40 years, there was a moment when they first saw A New Hope and the people who worked on it on New Hope were astounded, just like the moviegoers. Like, Can we do this? Wait a minute, that guy, he's a car mechanic, but he's got a great idea for this. That guy is a painter, he's a great painter. And this guy, he can make models. And those skills all put together with brilliant people created this thing that is so potent, it has effect, Im, Im, um, impacted movies ever since since 1977 and the people who did it in 1976 and 1975, their life was changed forever by being part of that. Sky Talkers wanted to know, what was the experience like for this project to interview your friends? It was great. And that was one of the biggest pleasures of the whole enterprise. And since I was focused from the get-go on the people, it was great to come back to people who I knew known a little bit, people I'd known a lot, and now it's much later, and they, they're looking back, I'm looking back, and generations after them that followed them are even looking back. And some of those younger people were looking back at the original people and going, wow, you know, that I could even be in a room with these people it was amazing. So I found the whole thing sort of emotional. I found it great the you know they are so brilliant and to see them generously sharing their gifts with each other and coming up with a product that maybe even the client didn't even know they wanted the client may have come to them and said i want something like this and what ilm has come up with thousands of times is something better than they imagined and I, I love that part of it. They've really been a part of the creative process for all these movies. Josh wants to know, when you are writing or creating these stories, how does your approach change when you consider the visual and special effects? And has that process changed after watching and directing this documentary? It hasn't changed because I think 
years ago, and it wasn't just when I got to Force Awakening, years ago, people realized that you can do anything. That, you know, a digital technology made anything possible. The, uh, you know, the lineage of physical effects helped in, in inform all these effects. And now we've seen people who are, want to go back to mix them better, you know, have it be a physical effect and a digital effect at the same time. So at no time in writing those or on Empire Strikes Back, did I have to say, can that be done? George would say, we'll figure it out. Or, you know, Stephen would say, I want something like this, but I'll make it work. You know, I, I mean, you guys have got to tell me how to do it. And so that has never changed. And there's never do you hear in this group of people, no, forget it, can't have it. They never say that. So I think that's really wonderful. Next up is Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland. Asking if any of his friends were holding back during interviews, did he have any secrets or tips to help to get them to loosen up and share more information? I had an incredible producing staff from Imagine. They've made a lot of docs, and a lot of the people don't work at Imagine, but they're freelancers that Imagine has worked with. I was exhilarated by the researchers, the producers, the archivists, they could come up with anything. And also we had Lucasfilm through their doors to the archive open for us. So there's a lot of stuff in this six hours that's never been seen before. And so that opens a lot of doors for the people in the interview. And you're able to show that same person 30 years younger, figuring out that problem. And I find that and that opens things up a lot. And I've always found that if you ask people, if you really are seeing people and listening to people, they will open up like flowers. And I didn't have people I felt were holding back. And if there was a slight hesitation, I would go to that space and say, well, how, tell me more about that. Tell me what you felt at that moment. Because that's not the first thing people would tell you, but it, it can be the second or third thing. Tara wants to know if there's a specific anecdote or line that Lawrence heard throughout these interviews that really stuck with him the most. No, I, I don't. And I got to say, this is sort of true of my life, too, which is I love being in an atmosphere. I love hearing people tell you the details of something that is no longer available to us. So what this, all these people in these interviews, they had the key. And they could tell me what happened back then behind closed doors and who helped you and which people came together to make that thing work. So I don't have a favorite. I have a feeling that a, a creative community was made there. And it is very emotional to me because these people are so appealing and so brilliant. And so many of them decided, you know, when they were 10 years old, they saw a logo for Industrial Light and Magic, and it represented everything they wanted, all the romance, all the drama. And so many of those people who saw it as children wound up working at ILM. And it's, it's an incredible situation to have the place be the fulfillment of all these people's dreams. Next up is James Burns from Jedi News, and he wants to know, how did Lawrence and the team go through all this extensive interviews and footage and narrow things down to just six hours of entertainment for this Disney Plus series. I'm glad you feel that way. Because um, I'm sure there are going to be people who say, six hours? What do I want to see all that for? But I liked your attitude. And um, there is, I had an amazing group of editors, great producers. And whenever I'd go into an interview, uh, we had done a lot of background work. And we knew where it fell and what we thought the story was. And yet we were completely open to, is this going to take us in a new place, a new direction? That's fine. I wanted that to happen. I wanted people to surprise me all the time and say, well, since we're talking about that, let me tell you about this. And that is where some of the best stuff comes from. And it, yeah, you could do a lot more than six hours, but you know, you have to have the desire. And I had the desire to see how did this happen? 
how did these people come to be there? How much did George know when he put together this group of, you know, people with all kinds of skills that weren't movie people? How did he have an instinct for that? And then once they came together, how did those very different people join together and become colleagues and friends and compatriots? That's what interested me. And I think that you get a lot of that from the essence of these people. For the last question of this roundtable, Caitlin wanted to know, what did he learn from ILM that surprised him after looking at and editing and creating this documentary? I think, you know, I went into it looking for the soul of the company. You know, you don't always think of that. You know, you think about um, Prudential Insurance. You don't think, I want to do a thing about the soul of Prudential Insurance. There probably is a soul of Prudential Insurance, but this one is very obvious that people who came there had a passion for this and that they stayed with it for years and years you know, John Knoll, who created Photoshop with his brother, um, he never stopped working. And he went right back to work the next day. You know, not all of us would make that choice if we created Photoshop. But John Knoll loves doing this work. And he went right back there and has stayed another 20 years. He's just, and that's what the place is like. It's about enormous passion for solving these problems and for creating new frontiers because that's really what they do listening to coffee with kenobi you are with dan z the podcast you're looking for this is That's going to do it for this week's episode of Coffee with Kenobi. I want to thank our amazing special guests for today's Coffee with Kenobi, Phil Tippett, Dennis Murin, Janet Lewin, and Lawrence Kasdan. Wow, wow, wow. Thanks so much for joining me and my peers for this incredible show. And I hope you're enjoying Light and Magic. We will certainly be looking at much more closely on Facebook Live every single Monday night. But before we do that, we have to finish what we're doing, which is watching Season 1 of Star Wars Rebels. Be sure to rewatch or watch for the first time Fire Across the Galaxy, the final episode in Season 1 of Star Wars Rebels. Get your top five ready and share it with us next Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I want to thank the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. For a no-cost, no-obligation quote, please use MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. They can help you plan your magical vacation to the Galactic Star Cruiser, Galaxy's Edge, the theme parks, the cruise lines, Star Wars Celebration next year, or anywhere else you want to go on vacation. It doesn't have to be Disney-related. And you will also be able to help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. Again, that is coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. I mentioned Facebook Live next Monday night. That's at coffeewithkenobi.com slash live. Or go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. And after all these things, go to our Coffee with Kenobi Facebook group at coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and join the CWK Cafe. It's a great place to go for Star Wars Thoughts comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly and spoiler and drama-free place. Coffee with Kenobi is possible because of the members of the CWK Alliance. Thanks to you, the podcast, Facebook Live, event coverage, and so much more comes to life. Find out how you can help the show for as little as $1 a month by joining the CWK Alliance. and You will receive access to CWK Prower, an exclusive weekly audio and video podcast not heard anywhere else at coffeewithkenobi.com slash support. And 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital. The website is coffeewithkenobi.com for stars, news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. You can certainly email me, danz at coffeewithkenobi.com. Connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at danzairecwk. Coffee with Kenobi is on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and TikTok. You can give the show a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. You can also subscribe to Coffee with Kenobi's YouTube channel where you can catch replays of CWK Live event coverage and so much more. Please, if you have a chance, take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. And if you like the t-shirts that you're seeing around town or at Star Wars Celebration, etc., go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash shop for the Coffee with Kenobi logo on t-shirts, hoodies, and so much more. Finally, if you want to start a podcast or a blog or have one already and want to expand your brand, Go to danzymedia.com and I can help you 
get that process started or expand your dreams. I'm also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. Thanks again for joining me on this amazing special episode where we get to look at light and magic and support coffee with Kenobi by not only joining me on Facebook Live, but letting your friends know or tagging on Facebook or shouting it out on Twitter that you're listening to the show so we can bring more people into this amazing Star Wars community. Have a great week and weekend, everybody. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.